Uh, thanks, Mike. Thanks for inviting me here. It's really great to, to be at the University of Toronto. Um, uh, so today I'm going to be talking about um, some recent developments involving applying some machine learning ideas to particle physics. Um, the, the talk is kind of two parts. The first part, I'll give you kind of an introduction to what are the interesting problems in particle physics, try to orient uh, uh, the particle physics, the modern particle collider physics as a sort of data science challenge. And then I'll show how some developments of the last you know, five years, but also the last six months um, to a year, have really taken hold and are, are directly applicable to the LHC. Um, so uh, to get started, let's see if this is working. Um, okay. Uh, well. hmm. right, let me not. Working a minute ago. I'm gonna try. Well, I have a pointer. That's not the problem. Technology. All right. I'll just use the keyboard. Um, Right, so this would really be a lot better. All right, never mind. Um, right, so what is the universe made of? So this was the picture that was sort of in the halls of physics departments around the world um, until 2012. Now we see a picture that looks more like this, right, where um, uh, we've, well, this is yours. No, this one's not working either. Ah, there we go. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the difference between this picture and this picture is, of course, this kind of keystone of the standard model known as the Higgs boson. Um, so to kind of motivate these machine learning developments, let me just sort of introduce the Higgs boson from the collider physics point of view. And the real question, the kind of underlying uh, motivation of a lot of what's going on in particle physics is, you know, the transition from this to this, but what's going to happen next? Are there missing particles? Are there supersymmetric particles? Are there other things that are going on? What is this picture going to look like, you know, a few years from now or 10 years from now or 100 years from now? Um, so to begin, let's talk about the Higgs boson. So the Higgs boson is um, a particle. And to, to understand it, we have to know what we knew about it before we made the LHC and sort of how we designed the LHC as a, a machine that would either find the Higgs boson or find something else. Um, so the Higgs boson, like any, any particle, you have to, to, to detect it, you need to do three things. You need to first produce it, and then you need to find it, and then you need to measure its properties to know that it is what you think it is. Um, so first of all, let's talk about producing it. Um, so the Higgs boson is very heavy. In order to produce something that's very heavy, you need, of course, um, uh, large energy. Um, so in particular, we knew before we turned on the LHC that the Higgs boson had to be billions of electron volts um, in energy. So you need a machine capable of producing billions of electron volts. And that's this Large Hadron Collider. Um, so uh, to give you a sense of scale, it's this 27-kilometer ring. Um, so superimposing it on Toronto, you see that it takes up much of the downtown area. Um, and of course, the real LHC is located on the border between France and uh, Switzerland near Geneva. Um, so this maybe give you a better sense of, of, of scale. Um, OK, so we have to be able to produce it. So we built this big machine to produce it, but we also need large intensity. So what does that mean? Well, the reason we need large intensity is because particles are produced using quantum mechanics. And in quantum mechanics, you never know exactly what you're going to get. You only know the probability that you're going to get something. So for example, if you measure the spin of an electron, you might find you know, 50% of the time it would be spin up, and 50% of the time it would be spin down. Uh, for the Higgs boson, it's not quite 50-50. It's more like one in a billion. So if you collide two protons, uh, one, most of the time, uh, you know, a billion minus one times, you'll uh, not get a Higgs boson. And you know, 0.000001% of the time, you'll get a Higgs boson. Um, so that means we need to collide a lot of protons together in order to find the Higgs boson. Um, so if we want. Uh, you know, a one in a billion chance, we want roughly a billion collisions per second so that accounting for efficiencies and detector response and so on, we have some sense of being able to measure enough Higgs bosons to see them. And I'll get into those numbers a little bit more as we go on. Um, so what does the LHC look like? It's a, it's a big ring, and I kind of drew a picture of the ring. It collides, protons go around this way and go around this way. And in order to get a billion collisions per second, you, get, you have to put a lot of protons together in a bunch. So these are bunches of protons with around um, 10 to the 11, so that's 100 billion protons in each bunch. Um, they're spaced 25 feet around, apart in a 27-kilometer ring, and they collide at four points, but really two main uh, points where they collide them down to the size of a human hair, right? So down to micron scale, they focus this beam of 10 to the 11 particles. So this is really sort of an engineering miracle. This is one of the greatest 
um, scientific uh, machines ever built, or machines that all ever built, and it's remarkable that it works so well. Um, so when you do all these collisions, you get a billion collisions per second. Now, the collisions themselves, if you tried to um, record the data from a collision, you would get about a megabyte um, per collision, right? Um, so if you're getting, uh, you need to record a megabyte, a uh, billion megabytes per second to your, to your disk drives, that's obviously impossible, um, just because of the, the throughput of the, of the writing. Uh, so the best you could do is roughly around 200, so roughly writing 200 megabytes a second to disk, which is still pretty fast, but that's about what the technology is capable of, or at least it was when they, when they built the LHC. Um, and anyway, that, that results in 10 petabytes per year of data. So this is an enormous amount of data, and somewhere in that, that 10 petabytes are these Higgs bosons. So we have to sift through this 10, 10 petabytes and find you know, a couple of megabytes of that 10 petabytes that represents the thing that we're actually looking for. Um, so how do you see a Higgs boson? So now you need to put in some theory. You need to understand what it looks like. Um, so the Higgs, we don't actually see the Higgs itself. We see its decay products. The Higgs is unstable and decays essentially instantaneously with a lifetime of 10 to the minus 22 seconds into lots of stuff. Um, and we're actually fairly lucky that the Higgs mass is what it is because we get a reasonable fractions of it decaying to um, different kinds of things. And this is good because by measuring different properties, we can, different decay modes, we can measure its properties um, exactly. Um, so a lot of these things have been measured. Um, uh, and in order to measure them, you see that the, to measure lots of different kinds of things, you need what's called a general purpose detector capable of measuring you know, photons and electrons and neutrons. You need to measure all kinds of different particles that you can see. Um, so this is an example of one of the general purpose detectors called CMS, compact muon solenoid. It doesn't look particularly compact, but relative to the, the next one, Atlas, which we'll see over here, um, which is so big it doesn't even fit on the slide, um, it, uh, it actually is compact. So both of these, you see a person for scale. These are giant toroids. This stands for a toroidal apparatus or something dumb like that. Uh, but these are big toroidal magnets. This is before it was all put together. Now this is all filled with electronics. Um, the same thing with CMS. So when the beam, the beam comes through this beam pipe here and the collisions are right in the middle and this is closed, it's just sandwiched together. And then all these electronics measure uh, all the different uh, parts of the, of the collision. So different parts near the middle are for measuring charged particles and then you measure energy of uh, you know, charged things or electromagnetic things and then hadronic things. Um, and then the final part that makes it so big is for measuring muons. Um, so these detectors are designed to measure all the different kinds of things that you can produce. Um, so out of this, what, what was actually seen when the Higgs was discovered? Um, well, it turns out we didn't look at all of these immediately. In fact, we still haven't seen all of these decay modes. Uh, the first mode that was seen, the kind of what's called the golden mode, is this mode where it decays to Z boson, so this purple slice here, but not all of that. Actually, only the Higgs decaying to Z bosons, and then the Z bosons themselves decay to muons or electrons. Um, and then only decay 6% of the time to these guys. So you actually get only of the 3%, only six times six percent of that, or roughly one event per day. So out of the billions of collisions a second, one Higgs a second, you actually get one of these golden channel decay modes of the Higgs boson um, uh, per day. Another one they measured is Higgs to photons, which also has this very small branching ratio of 0.2 percent. And then finally, they measure the W, also the W Higgs to two W bosons, which also decay to these muons and electrons. Um, so what do these look like? So these are the Higgs discovery plots from uh, uh, or maybe slightly updated, but around, from around 2012. Um, and I just want to emphasize some, some qualitative features. So what's being shown here in this one is the invariant mass of a pair of, of these four things. So what you're looking for is a peak, a bump, when, you, when they came from the decay of the Higgs boson. So all of these events that came from a Higgs would have uh, uh, the same value of this variable. And everything else, for example, these ZC star events, whatever those are, and Z plus jet events, um, they're all this other stuff. Right? So you can see by eye that if you just look at these black dots, which are the data, there's a peak here that's not described by this blue and purple background. Right? So in this case, you can really see by eye that there's a clear bump and there's evidence of something new, not explained by these other non-Higgs backgrounds. Um, it's similar for this Higgs to photon-photon channel, um, where you see a bump by eye. Um, but notice that, that you can't really see it. If I didn't draw this yellow curve, which is really just a smooth fit to the background, and I didn't draw the red curve drawing the bump, so I just drew the black dots, Fortunately, I don't have access to this, and they probably don't give it to you for a good reason. Um, you know, you might think there was a bump here or a bump here. You might not be able to see the, eye, the, back, the bump by eye. Um, in particular, uh, uh, you need to know the, the shape of this region here to see the excess over that region. Um, and finally, for the WW events, which are Higgs to electron, muon, and neutrinos, uh, this isn't the invariant mass. It's something else called the transverse mass. And you actually don't see a bump, but you see an excess. So you see that the black dots 
are the sum of these backgrounds plus the red, which is the Higgs boson. Um, so what I really want to emphasize here is that these are, um, you know, they all give clear evidence of a Higgs boson, but with, with lessening amount of, you know, clarity. So this one, you see a clear bump, and there's basically no background in the signal region. Here there's a bump, but you need to know the background. Of course, you don't need to know it exactly from theory. You can just fit a smooth curve to the background, so do a data-driven analysis. Um, but here you actually need to know it very quantitatively from a theoretical prediction. Um, so this is the hardest, this is next hard, and this is uh, 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 pretty easy. But of course, these are all easy compared to other stuff, uh, which I'm going to talk about soon. Um, so what do you do next? Well, you know, you want to know, is it the Higgs boson? So this was enough to claim that it was a, a, a Higgs-like particle discovered. We really want to know if it's the Higgs boson. So you really want to measure its properties. You want to measure as many decay modes as possible, as quantitatively as possible, and see how it compares to the precise prediction from, from the standard model of particle physics. Um, so what are these other things? So we talked a little bit about the Z bosons and the W bosons and the photons. Um, obviously, you want to look at the dominant decay, which is the quarks. Um, so what do those look like? Well, they look like things called jets. And I'll talk about jets in a minute, but they're basically collimated beams of particles. Um, what about the gluons? Um, well, those also look like jets, right? So you get actually 69% um, uh, jets. Uh, so next, we can talk about the W boson. So I talked about this decay mode, which is the one we measured and I showed the plot for. But actually, most of the time, uh, of this 21%, 20.2% is also the jets, right? <laughs> And it's the same with the Z boson. And actually, the tauons are also a different kind of jets. Um, so out of all the possible decay modes of the Higgs, most of them are the jets, and none of this was used in the discovery of the Higgs. So we're throwing out 98% of the events because they're kind of harder to deal with. Uh, and that's really going to be the subject of this talk, how to understand those jets. Um, so what is a jet? So this is an event display of a jet. This is the atlas detector. The beam collides here. This is a, a reconstruction of the event using the measurements in the detector. So the collision is here. There's a spray of particles. And you see that there's a beam. So this, the size of these histograms represents the energy that goes in that direction. And you see there's two beams of energy that aren't quite back-to-back uh, -back because the whole thing has some, some uh, momentum going in the, in the direction of the beam. Um, but uh, they're still pretty collimated. Um, so from the, the, the point of view of particle physics, what's going on is there's a collision, and you produce a, a quark. And the quark radiates gluons, and the gluons then form this jet of particles. So this is like bremsstrahlung of electrons from uh, photons from an accelerated electron, but the quantum chromodynamics version. Um, I can kind of draw a, a cartoon of this to show in a little bit more detail what's going on in a collision. So here's two protons. If we zoom into the center of the proton, um, you see that it's, it's made up of basically a weakly interacting soup of different kinds of particles, of quarks and gluons and kind of virtual and real gluons um, that are sort of floating around. And the reason this picture is useful is because the strong force, unlike the electric force, has this funny property that it's weak at short distances and strong at large distances. And this is the property of asymptotic freedom, which is critical to all the phenomenology of the strong force. I'm not going to talk in detail about um, how the strong force quantum chromodynamics works. I'm just going to tell you this qualitative property, which is really all you need to understand the formation of jets. Um, so what happens when you collide two of these protons together, most of the time they just pass through each other. Right? But sometimes you get one of these hard objects within the proton to bang into another hard object. And you can calculate that. Um, you, you can't really calculate it from first principles, but you can see that it's sort of universal and measure the probability that this happens. Uh, and when two of these quarks collide together, which can happen at a scale a hundredth the size of the proton, uh, then you get a, a collision which produces some radiation. So you have a collision here, and then particles move out. And as they move out, they radiate. So they have this bremsstrahlung process where you produce lots of particles that are going in the direction um, of, of the, the sort of primordial quark. And then what happens is the particles reach the edge of the proton, uh, where the strong force becomes strong. And when that happens, you have confinement kicks in. And all these particles turn into neutral part, color neutral particles, mesons and baryons that we measure, so kaons and neutrons and pions. And these are the things that leave the proton and go out into the detector and get measured. Um, so the point is, we see these, these collimated collections of particles called jets. And what they give is an imprint of what's happening inside the proton. So they're kind of a photograph of the proton that gets imprinted as the particles leave um, uh, uh, the, the, the radius of the proton. And that's why they're interesting. And that's why they tell us about things like the Higgs boson. So again, here's an event display. Um, OK, so we want to study jets. Um, now, the, the, the key thing, and this is the development of the last five to 10 years, is that a jet is not always a jet. 
right? So when the LHC was designed, basically they said, forget about this 98%, we're never going to measure it. Um, but what's happened over the last 10 years in, in, in particle physics, both on the experimental and theoretical side, is people have realized that actually these jets are different. So there's these things called B jets, and then there's things called light quark jets and gluon jets, something called tau jets. Um, and then, of course, there's these leptons, electrons and muons, which are the 1.8% that we knew before. Um, so you want to find the things like a Higgs boson um, uh, uh, decaying to jets. Unfortunately, the, uh, the Higgs boson decaying to jets looks a lot like just jets coming from colliding two protons, like in that animation. Right? And the problem is there's billions and billions and billions of these. So for every Higgs boson, um, we're going to have billions of, of non-Higgs boson jets. So we have to be able to distinguish what kind of jets they are, but also properties of the jets uh, to tell them apart. Um, okay. So that's sort of a motivation in, uh, to why jet physics is interesting. And now I'm going to tell you about some developments and techniques to resolve properties of these jets um, and distinguish them, both traditional approaches that have been done you know, five to 10 years ago, um, and then some developments in the last year or so involving uh, modern machine learning. Um, so just to kind of a, a, an idea of what kind of properties you might use to distinguish quarks and gluons, as I said, both of them, they produce this jet structure due to the Bremsstrahlung process. Um, and just like in, in electrodynamics, it, or just classical electromagnetism, if you have a charged particle, the larger the charge of the particle, the more it radiates, right? So the same is true in QCD. And the, 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 roughly the, the, the unit of charge is this, what's called a group Casimir for the color force, for SU3. But it comes out to roughly a, a third, a 1.3 for a quark and 3 for a gluon. Um, there's a, a, a way to understand this as uh, um, in a quark case, there's really a, a color string that splits, and a gluon is kind of two color strings, so you have roughly twice the probability of splitting because it's twice the color. Um, I, maybe this isn't useful to anyone who's never seen this before. Um, but the bottom line is they're basically twice as charged. And twice as charged means they have twice as much radiation, which means the jets are twice as fat on average, um, and they're twice as wide, and they have twice as many particles, and all of these features that can be used to tell them apart. Um, so what do you do about that? Um, well, the first thing you do is run some simulations to see what they look like. So this is an example of uh, the mass of a jet, and the blue here is the gluon jet, and a, uh, the blue here is a quark jet, and the red is the gluon jet. So the idea here is the jet mass, if I see it has a larger mass, it's more likely to be gluon, and if it has a smaller mass, it's more likely to be quark. Um, so I'll be talking about a lot of uh, these called discriminants as we go on, and I just want to show you how we quantify uh, how useful it is as a discriminant. So what we do is we put a cut, so for example, I put a cut where this black line is, um, and I see what the efficiency, how much of the blue is kept, which is the quark efficiency, and how much of the red is kept, which is the gluon efficiency. And then as I move the cut um, across the graph, I get a curve, which is the, what's called the receiver operating characteristic, which tells you how the efficiency uh, uh, varies as I move the cut. Um, another, char another thing that, that we look at is what's called the significant improvement characteristic, which is simply this axis divided by the square root of that. Um, and the reason this is useful, well, there's two reasons. One is it represents how much you can improve significance, so signal over root background by putting a particular cut on this variable. But a more useful feature is that it has a peak, so you can compare two variables. For example, this might be jet mass, and then I could also look at the number of charged particles in a jet, which has a qualitatively similar shape, um, but it might have a very different uh, rock curve or sick curve, right? And so the idea is here, the higher this curve, the better a discriminant uh, uh, the variable is. Um, so one approach to distinguishing them is just to start cataloging different possible discriminants. So you just rack your brain, think of everything you can think of that might tell a quark or a gluon jet apart. So you might look at the jet mass, you might look at the particle, particle count, you might look at jet broadening, which is kind of a first moment of the jet, you might look at something else called the angularity, there's the fraction of the third hardest subjet in the jet, um, there's something called the moment of who, there's you know, thousands and thousands of these things. Um, uh, some are well motivated, some aren't. Um, but they all have different discrimination power. Um, so you can characterize these, but what you really like to know is not only what's the best single variable, but how are they correlated and how do you involve, how do you combine them to get even better discriminant than, than either one is separately. Um, so for example, we might have these two discriminants, x and y, say, you know, jet mass and particle multiplicity, and they might have these different significant curves. Uh, now I can, I can look at their distribution in two dimensions, so this might be for a quark and a gluon. Um, and then I can compute the, the likelihood ratio using a thousand events. So if this is the probability that a given point is quark, and this is the probability that a given point, that, this is the probability that given a quark, I get a certain value of these two variables. 
And this is the probability that given it's a gluon, I get the two value, the value. What I'd like to know is, given the value of x and y, what is the probability that it's a quark instead of a gluon, right? So that involves inverting these. Um, and you can get this likelihood distribution. So certainly if you have enough statistics in this distribution, you can just compute this directly. Um, and once you have that, you can draw contours, so likelihood contours. And, and now what you want to do is cut in two dimensions by varying along contours of constant likelihood. Um, so you might find something like that when you, so x might have this discrimination power, y that one, and when you combine them, you get something that's obviously going to be better than both. Um, the problem is, you need roughly uh, the square of the number of events in order to actually work out the likelihood distribution. So if I have a thousand events with quark and a thousand events with gluon, um, if I put a thousand events in the two-dimensional distribution, I don't get a very good um, likelihood contour. You can't really see by eye, at least, what the right um, contours are to choose. Um, and this gets bad when you try to combine more variables. So for one variable, you might need a thousand events to get a good one-dimensional distribution. So like these things involve a, roughly a thousand events. Um, for two variables, you might need a million, and so on. And it goes roughly like 10 to the, 10 to the or 1,000 to the n um, uh, number of events you need to get a good, a good map of the likelihood distribution. Um, so this is clearly intractable past two variables, so we have to turn to um, computer science, to so multivariate methods that can figure out how to not give the exact likelihood, but give a good enough approximation to it that it gets discrimination power that's comparable with the, the exact optimal, which is this likelihood. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few. Most of this talk, I'll talk about things called artificial neural networks. Um, to begin, I want to talk about boosted decision trees, which is a more traditional method um, that tends up to be very powerful for certain types of things. There's, of course, a whole list of different types of multivariate methods that are useful in lots of different areas of science, um, and I just don't have time to talk about most of them. I should say that they really haven't had good application in particle physics, and particle physics focus mostly on these two. Um, so what is a boosted decision tree? Well, first, what is a decision tree? So a decision tree is just a simple set of cuts that are kind of stacked. So a cut is, so I have two variables, say C for charge particle count and G for girth or, or something like that. Um, so I might say if it's less than some variable, I call it a, a quark. And if it's greater, then I ask another question, is this other variable greater or less than one, right? So if this is C and this is G, C less than 15, it's over here. So that's blue for sure. And if, then if it's over here, if I ask if it's greater than or less than one, I call it a G. Right, so then I can carve out this square region, which is maybe a good first approximation to this likelihood contour. Right? So that's one decision tree. But of course, it's not exact, because you don't get this white region right, and this bends a little, and this has to be square kind of by construction. So what do you do to get something that's a little bit more involved? Um, then you can use another tree. So the idea behind boosted decision trees is you take your first tree, your best guess, which gives you the best first approximation to the likelihood. Um, and then you take another tree, which tries to uh, correctly classify the events that the first tree didn't classify right. So you might have a different set of cuts, which might look like that. Um, and then you take the two trees and you sort of have them vote. And you ask, did both of them say it was a quark, in which case you make it red, or one of them said it was a quark, and one of them said it was a gluon, or the other one. And so you get these different shaded contours, and you can weight them differently. Right? You should weight this a little more because it was the best, and then this a little bit less, and so on. So boosting is the combination of different decision trees that allow you to get um, a more nuanced um, set of contours. Um, so as an example, here's two variables. This is some angle, and this is some other angle. And I just chose these because they give you this interesting likelihood function that's um, non-convex and has interesting structure. Um, but again, this is the quark distribution. This is the gluon, the exact likelihood, which I compute with a million events. But now let me try training it on 1,000 events and see if the boosted decision tree can converge. And you see with two trees, you get a structure that I drew before. With eight trees, you get something that starts to look like that. And by 256 trees, you get something that's actually a very good approximation to the exact likelihood. Um, so these methods tend to work pretty well. Um, as an example, for the quark-gluon discrimination, so this, this plot shows the significance improvement curves on actual simulated events. Um, the single variables are kind of here, so things like jet shape or planar flow or mass are these curves. Um, and I show the two best ones here, which are particle count and jet width. And then this red curve shows what you get when you combine uh, the best five single variables. Um, so you see you do, you do much better. And just to be a little more quantitative about it, see the best a single variable can do is a roughly 1.9, right? And so that means 1.9 improvement in significance. So if you cut on this variable, your significance will go up by a factor of 1.9. But if I combine them with the boosted decision tree, I can improve by 2.2. So that actually is a very large improvement in significance. Um, so that's substantial. Um, but that's about as good as you can do combining these variables with boosted decision trees. OK, so now let's get on to the, 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 the meat of the talk, which is modern machine learning. So this is where the story ended 
um, I don't know, three or four years ago, uh, people kind of thought about these variables, combined them with traditional multivariate methods, and you know, we did pretty well, and actually these methods have been tested on data, and they work about as well as they do in simulations. Um, so what's the difference? What do I mean by modern machine learning? Uh, I'd like to make this as kind of a contrast between calculating things, you know, thinking about observables and then combining them, to something a little bit more intuitive. Um, so what do I mean by that? Let me kind of draw this flow chart. All right, so this traditional approach that I just discussed, you think about the physics, you say, well, quarks are fatter than gluons and so on. Uh, you derive some observables, well, jet mass might measure that, run some simulations, and then I can combine the best variables I get using boosted decision trees or some other methods. Then you get this multivariate discriminant, and then you test it in simulation, test it on data. The modern machine learning approach is, let's not think about physics at all. I'm not gonna tell you what I know about quarks and gluons. I'm not gonna say quarks are fatter than gluons or jet broadening should be correlated with particle multiplicity or anything like that. I'm just gonna not think about it, run simulations, or ideally just look at the data directly um, and have the computer learn the discrimination on its own. Have it figure out what a useful discriminant is. Right? And so I'm not gonna bias it by my own uh, you know, ability to calculate or what I think of. I'm gonna have it try to do the thinking um, and you know, come up with a more intuitive picture that I may not understand, uh, but may in fact end up discriminating better between quarks and gluons, or whatever the process is, um, than my thought. Um, okay, so to get some details, we have to first understand neural networks. So a lot of the modern machine learning involves neural networks. What is a neural network? Um, a neural network takes as a, a inputs, a, 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 so the left-hand side is the input, and the network flows this way. So a simple network, what's called a shallow network, um, might have some, some finite set of nodes in the middle, and the inputs are the value of some observables, like jet mass, or particle count, or insubjectiveness. You know, these other just single variable discriminants. Uh, and then it calculates this hidden layer. So each of these nodes is a function of the inputs. And the function is given by something called an activation function, which might look like this, uh, acted on some sum of weights W times X. And what you want to do is, uh, is find the value of these weights uh, that maximizes the discrimination power. So these Ys are a function of this. And then these quarks have some other weights that are functions of these Ys. Um, and what you want to do is get, you know, in the end, you want to get a, a zero if it's a quark and a one if it's a gluon. So you try to compare the output. So you, want, you want to minimize the function, which is you give it some truth information where you know the answer, and you try to figure out what network would best combine these to determine the answer. Um, so that's basically the structure of a network. It's just a function, right? The idea is the network is just some function, and it's a way of constructing a nonlinear function of the inputs that is sort of easy to optimize in some way. Of course, it's not always easy to optimize. But there's general results that this can, the, the neural network can describe any, any possible function. Um, so that by finding these weights, if there is a good discriminant, it will find it eventually if you gave it an infinitely complicated network and infinite training time. Um, so deep network just means lots of hidden layers. And traditionally, these deep networks have been very hard to train because they have so many parameters that you get stuck in local minima and it ends up not converging very well. Um, so what is this revolution in machine learning all about? Um, well, there's been a lot of things. So, so there's developments in what I call algorithms and developments in computing. So the algorithms, and I'll talk about these in, in, in some detail, so there's been things like moving away from biological inspiration. So original artificial neural networks were supposed to be uh, mirrored after biological neural networks, which have you know, neurons, and, and that activation function I showed was supposed to be the, uh, the activation of an actual neuron when you have an uh, impulse. Um, but there's things like downsampling, which is an algorithmic thing that's supposed to reduce noise, make it less sensitive to training. There's loss functions, which is how you weight the input, the, the, the thing that you're actually minimizing, the function of the output variables. It doesn't have to be the difference squared. It can be something else, things like cross-entropy loss. And I'm not going to go into details of these. Um, um, the main advance, I think, is about the network architecture. And I'll talk about that in some detail, which is that it's not just plug things into a deep network and let it run. It's think about the process, think about the inputs, and think about a smarter way to represent the information. And that's really the main thing. Of course, this is, this is <coughs> the reason any of this is possible is because developments in computers, you know, in the, you know today computers are, are much, much faster than they were 10 years ago or 30 years ago when neural networks were originally invented. Um, and faster computing capabilities really mean not just that the networks work better, but that it's easier to, to, to test things and try out different algorithms and compare different approaches. And so the, the theory advances as well as the actual final product for the network to do the discrimination. Um, another thing that, that actually is very important is these open source libraries. So what's happened over the last few years is it's become this global community of you know, professionals and amateurs and dilettantes and high school students and professors all sharing their code online, you know, through things like GitHub and just, you know, on the web. 
and people talking about things and this, this constant, this very efficient communication about ideas. And so when someone has an idea in Norway, it immediately spreads and people in China start implementing it and you know, some, some student in Brazil figures out it works better than something else. And everything just comes very, very fast. And so there's this rapid development of the technology from the global community. And that, I think, is one of the most important um, contributions to the rapid development of machine learning and will continue. Um, uh, OK, so let me just get into some details of these advances. So I, I, I mentioned these activation functions. So this is the input of the nonlinearity to the neural network. If there weren't an activation function, it would just be linear, and it wouldn't be able to construct any function. Um, so for, for 30 years, neural networks all involved this thing called a sigmoid, which is basically a, a, a function that models how a neuron sees an impulse. So what, the neuron, what happens with a neuron is you start putting some, some uh, electrical impulse, and when it reaches a certain amount, here zero, some threshold, then the neuron fires. Right? So it's either a fire or it doesn't fire. So it's zero or one, and there's a very little range in the middle where you have any sensitivity to the amount of input. Right? Um, of course, this is a nonlinear function, so it can be used to construct any neural network. Um, now, uh, in around 2011, this other recti the, uh, activation function was introduced called the rectified linear unit, or RELU, um, which is very simple. So it doesn't look like this. It has, it's basically zero here and then becomes linear. Um, so this has a number of advantages over the, the sigmoid. Uh, one is that it being linear, it's very easy to take the gradient, the derivative. So when you do gradient descent, it's extremely fast. Um, it also doesn't saturate because it keeps growing. It means the output grows as the input grows. So as long as it's firing, the larger the input signal, the more it'll fire. And so, you rep so, so it becomes more sensitive to larger input signals, which is important um, for a lot of you know, non-biological applications. Um, um, I should mention there's another activation function called the ELU, which was actually introduced only about uh, two years ago, uh, which turns out to be critical. So in a project I'm doing, using the ReLU, it didn't work. But with the ELU, it does work. So these are developments just from two years ago introduced in computer science that already are, are becoming the standard uh, throughout not just computer science, but other applications. So this is like the, it's like the ReLU, but, um, but flattened off a little with an exponential to the negative values. So what this does is it avoids saturation at, at negative values. So it becomes sensitive. It pushes it towards minus infinity. So it helps with dropout and reducing sensitivity to noise. Excuse me. This uh, activation function was defined in the previous slide. I mean, introduced in the, pr in the previous slide. Uh, yeah, you want to remember what they are? So yeah. it's this thing, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So it's the thing that acts on the sum of the weights. So it always has this linear sum of weights, but it's the function that tells you how this acts on those. In fact, it's very simple. So you have a fixed function and then acting on the sum of Yeah, the this is really simple. These neural are simple. You can write. You know, write one down in five minutes in any computer language. Um, but of course, these are much more sophisticated. And, and as I said, the, the reason you can't do that is because the you know, implementing you know, uh, uh, you know, cross entropy loss and doing the gradient descent using the atom optimization algorithm, right? These things are not so easy to do yourself, but it's really five lines of Python code downloading some public open source libraries, right? So you would not say iterate this function somehow, modif modify this function depending on step. You could do that too. Um, that's, that's one, but you generally don't need to. But you could certainly use different activation functions for different nodes. Um, there isn't really good uh, uh, um, direction for, for how to pick activation functions. So a lot of it is just trial and error. There isn't, there isn't a great understanding of how to optimize it or how to figure out what the best activation function is. Um, uh, there's no, the activation function doesn't change, if that's what you mean. It could, and there's networks that do evolve the activation functions, but they don't tend to work better than ones in which you just evolve the weights. Um, uh, a lot of these things are active areas of research. OK, so now I want to talk about network architecture. So I mentioned one of the best advances is the fact that network architectures can be adapted to application. Um, so you've heard about dense, uh, 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 deep neural networks. So this is deep learning. It's the idea that you just have many layers, which of course can get any function. And it used to be that you could have one layer with lots of nodes, um, and that was much easier to train than lots of layers with less nodes, with fewer nodes. Um, but these get, these, the total nodes you need to get a same, the same function is smaller if it's deeper than if it's, if it's shallow and large. Um, but it was very hard to train them. And advances in recent years have made it easier to train deep networks. Um, um, but besides just having all the nodes connected to all the other nodes, advances are things like convolutional neural networks. And I'll talk about these. Um, in a bit of detail, but the idea is you have, this is used for image recognition. So image recognition, you look for patterns. So the, pa the idea is that if you're looking for something here, it doesn't matter where in the image it is. So you take this smaller patch of a bigger image and move it around. So instead of 
training a, a, a set of nodes that link to every pixel in the image, you just link to, say, a 5 by 5 pixel square or a 30 by 30 pixel square and move that around. And so you train it to look for a, a translation invariant way for features in the image. Um, things like adversarial neural networks. So this is how uh, computers beat Go, beat grandmasters in Go. It's having a network train off of another network. So you have one evolve and then the other play against it and see if it can uh, uh, do better through competition. Um, this thing's called recurrent neural networks, which don't have a fixed size. Um, so they have variable length inputs, which is something that also developed. It's obviously not biologically inspired, but is very useful. Um, recursive neural networks, where you have nodes that feed back on themselves, um, or use the same node many, many times. Uh, this also is a development that, that, that is useful for a lot of applications. Um, and I'll talk about some of these in physics um, as we go on. Uh, so let me start with, with uh, CNNs, convolutional neural networks. Uh, so again, the idea here is that if you're looking for facial recognition, this is the, the uh, killer app of, of convolutional networks, um, you would train these filters, and each filter might pick out a different feature. So you might have uh, some filter would, would look for the eye, right? So, so you're, not telling it, you're not telling the network what these filters should look like. All you're doing is, is initializing your network and having it figure out what filters best discriminate different kinds of images. So you look for cats for dogs, but you also look for faces, right? So what the networks, if you, if you look at what the shape of these images are, you see that these filters are picking out in different features. This one seems to be picking out on a nose. This is maybe a lip. Um, and that's an eye. Right? So you're not putting this in by hand. You're not telling it, I want to look for an eye. That was the kind of old-fashioned approach to uh, uh, facial recognition, where you scan a face and try to find the nose and find the eye and look for you know, 10 different parts of the eye. Um, here, you don't do that at all. And these networks tend to work a lot better at facial recognition than traditional approaches. Right? So this is the calculator versus brain approach. You let the, let the network figure out what's interesting. And it turns out to find things that you like, but you don't know if it's thinking of them exactly the same way that you would be. Um, OK, so what does this have to do with physics? Um, so the idea of applying this to physics is to treat the deposits of, in, the, in the detector as uh, pixels in an image. So you have, two, you have a collision here, and you have some radiation. Um, and this is supposed to represent the side of the detector. And this, the color of these pixels might represent the energy that appears in each region in the kind of region of a calorimeter. Um, so you take this square, and you unfold it. Um, and you might get a different kind of pattern if you have a certain type of jet. This is called a background jet in this example. And this might be a jet coming from the decay of a W boson. As I mentioned, most of the time a W boson decays the jets. The jets kind of look like this, not like this. So you say, well, this image looks different from this. This is like you know, uh, uh, Trump's face, and this is Trudeau's face. And they're slightly different. <laughs> and if you had the right software that could distinguish them, you might find them. Right? So this was developed not using uh, neural networks, but just to kind of think about the images of discriminants. Um, but you can actually apply it to this process of W tagging. And what you see, this is one of those rock curves, but kind of upside down that the convolutional neural network does better. So better is in this direction, and it does better than the single variables. Um, uh, so let me talk about quark gluons, because that's where I've introduced the talk. So this is work I did um, uh, last December. Um, and so the idea here is we, we took as inputs, we, we use not just uh, image recognition technology, but color input image recognition technology. So we had three input layers, which you think of the, the RGB images. Uh, the red was the energy of the charged particle. So these are things that the detectors can actually distinguish. The green was the energy of the neutral particles. So charged particles are things like protons or electrons. Neutral particles are things like neutrons um, or photons. And then their blue are the number of charged particles, which you can also measure to some, to some decent um, um, approximation. Uh, so then we did some pre-processing where we kind of normalized the images. Maybe it doesn't really matter. Um, and then we, we constructed a neural network. And this is a pretty standard neural network architecture where you have this decreasing size of, of network. So we have these convolutional filters. So our original image um, were 32 by 32, but we start with 8 by 8 filters that we move around the image. And then we to use 4 by 4 filters on top of those 8 by 8 filters, and then 2 by 2 filters, and then 1 by 1 filters, which are just nodes. Um, so this is this final dense layer that we connect to all the networks. And we use that to discriminate um, quarks and gluons. Um, so how does it work? Uh, so this is a result showing the efficiency. And these are similar numbers to what I had before, where we have the boosted decision tree involving the top five variables is around 2.2. Um, and what we see is using this color neural network, we get up to you know, 3.2. So a huge improvement in significance. Right? And for, this is, you know, for me, and I spent a lot of time thinking about this quark gluon stuff and studying moment of hue and all this stuff and, and trying to figure out what would be useful, I, you know, I wouldn't have imagined that it's possible to do this much better. Right? But somehow, these neural networks, where I'm just giving them these images, I'm not telling them anything about what a quark or gluon is, is doing better than any idea that I could come up with. Right? So this is, I, 
I don't know, this is one of the most impressive results. You know, I mean, of course, neural networks are very new in particle physics, but so far, um, I think this is very impressive that there's something going on here that we don't understand, and there's a very bright future for the application of these methods um, in, in, in particle physics. Um, okay, so uh, other ideas. So, um, uh, so, so obviously you want to try this stuff in data, right? All the stuff I've showed you so far is simulation. Here's some data. So this is the study from Atlas, one of the big experiments, where they tried to measure properties of quarks and gluons. So this is the jet width, which is one of those single variable discriminants. Um, and uh, gluons are blue and quarks are red. And the point here is that there's just different, the, the, the blue is pretty broad. And this has to do with different simulations. So the simulations are Herwig and Pythia. And the data kind of falls in between the two simulations. So what it tells you is, we have these simulations that we use to train our networks, but they don't really work. Right? Or they work sort of well. They work well for quarks, but don't work well for gluons. So this is a problem if we want to use the, the networks to, um, the, the simulations to train the networks. And the question is, can you, can you train the networks directly on the data without involving the simulation at all to resolve this problem? Um, so how do you do that? Well, the thing I've been doing is saying, well, we have this pure sample of gluon jets and the pure sample of quark jets. They're pure because I simulate quarks and I simulate gluons. And so I have the network knows exactly what the truth is. And so I can have this loss function that tells you what the truth is. Um, but the data doesn't have this. The data might have a sample from you know, events with jets in them. And the typical event with jets might be 80% gluon jets. And I might have some other set of jets that have, say, uh, a photon plus a jet. And that set of jets might be 60% um, quarks. Right? But I never have pure samples in the data. I only have these mixed samples. Now, if you, had, uh, if you knew exactly what the admixture was of the sample, you can just unfold this. So if I know this distribution and this distribution, so that is, this function is some linear combination of these two functions. I can just invert and figure out exactly what these functions are from those functions. Um, so you could do that if you had a single variable. And something like this was used in that Atlas study that I showed with the data in order to, to extract the quark and gluon templates um, from the data. But of course, if you have multivariate discriminants, this won't be possible because you can't invert the likelihood distribution because you only have 1,000 events. Um, um, but it turns out that you don't need to train the network to discriminate the individual variables in the multivariate discrimination. It's enough to discriminate the actual neural network. So what you do is, and, and this is sort of a complicated algorithm, but it's something called, uh, um, it, it, it's something called weak supervision. And what it lets you do is reduce the multidimensional problem to a one-dimensional problem, where you're just trying to regress the neural network output from the data instead of the um, uh, instead of the, vari the individual variables you're putting into the multidimensional discriminant. Uh, so this idea of weak supervision, so just to be clear about the terminology, what I've been talking about so far is supervised learning, where you tell it exactly what the answer is. You know, I tell it this is a cat and this is a dog, and I have the network learn to distinguish them. Um, this thing called weak learning, weak supervision, um, involves telling it not exactly which is cats and dogs, but I might tell you this is 30% cats and this You gotta press and hold the knob on for 30 seconds. Now you're on. Yeah, I have one there. Yeah, well, I don't have a USB, so it's hard to plug it in. This is a Bluetooth. Do you have a Bluetooth one? So, no, all I have is like a. I gotta get with it, man. You guys are back in the, you know, 2016s or so.
um, this year. Um, Matt is one of those physicists I find who I think is, is interested and knowledgeable in, as far as I can tell, pretty much everything. Um, he started his career, actually, professor career, actually, in biophysics, getting a, a bachelor's degree in mathematics and biophysics at Penn in 1998. And after that, he switched to particle theory and got a PhD from Princeton, working with Lisa Randall in 2003. He has postdoctoral positions at Berkeley and Johns Hopkins, and he has been a professor at Harvard since 2008. Um, and he is a theorist, but he also knows that he's also affiliated with the Atlas Club, has been affiliated with the Atlas Collaboration since 2013. And Matt has made major contributions in all sorts of areas of elementary particle theory and phenomenology in particular, particularly for collider physics. He's done seminal work on the use of jet substructure to analyze results of the ionic state on applications of effective field theory to uh, collider physics, particularly with respect to uh, observables called event shape calculations. But he's got broad interest in quantum field theory in general, with interest ranging from the subtleties of the infrared structure of gauge theories to scattering amplitudes of multiple external particles, beyond the standard model of physics, effective theories of gravity, and as the title of his current talk attests, he's now thinking a little bit about modern machine learning. Um, at the same time, as he's been doing his seminal research, Matt has been teaching for many years the uh, uh, introductory quantum field theory course at Harvard, and as uh, I guess a byproduct of that, um, he has produced an extremely well-reviewed uh, new textbook on quantum field theory on the standard model, which you have a copy, I'm sure he will find it for you after. <laughs> And if you look at the back, it's uh, highly praised from such uh, luminaries in the field of Ben Witten, Howard Jurisa, and Michael Peskin, Niemar, Connie Hammett, and Mark Wise. Um, on the insights that it gives to the subject. So let me introduce Matt Schwartz. Uh, thanks, Mike. Thanks for inviting me here. It's really great to, to be at the University of Toronto. Um, uh, so today I'm going to be talking about um, some recent developments involving applying some machine learning ideas to particle physics. Um, the, the talk is kind of two parts. The first part I'll give you kind of an introduction to what are the interesting problems in particle physics, try to orient uh, uh, the particle physics, the modern particle collider physics as a sort of data science challenge. And then I'll show how some developments of the last you know, five years, but also the last six months, um, to a year have really taken hold and are, are directly applicable to the LHC. Um, so uh, to get started, let's see if this is working. Oops. Let's see if this is. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, huh? hmm. All right, let me not. It's working a minute ago. I'm going to try. Well, I have a pointer. That's not the problem. Technology. All right, I'll just use the keyboard. Um, right, so this would really be a lot better. All right, never mind. Um, Right, so what is the universe made of? So this was the picture that was sort of in the halls of physics departments around the world um, until 2012. Now we see a picture that looks more like this, right, where um, uh, we've, well, this is yours. No, this one's not working either. Ah, there we go. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the difference between this picture and this picture is, of course, this kind of keystone of the standard model known as the Higgs boson. Um, so to kind of motivate these machine learning developments, let me just sort of introduce the Higgs boson from the collider physics point of view. And the real question, the kind of underlying uh, motivation of a lot of what's going on in particle physics is, you know, the transition from this to this, but what's going to happen next? Are there missing particles? Are there supersymmetric particles? Are there other things that are going on? What is this picture going to look like, you know, a few years from now or 10 years from now or 100 years from now? Um, so to begin, let's talk about the Higgs boson. So the Higgs boson is um, a particle. And to, to understand it, we have to know what we knew about it before we made the LHC and sort of how we designed the LHC as a, a machine that would either find the Higgs boson or find something else. Um, so the Higgs boson, like any, any particle, you have to, to, to detect it, you need to do three things. You need to first produce it, and then you need to find it, and then you need to measure its properties to know that it is what you think it is. Um, so first of all, let's talk about producing it. Um, so the Higgs boson is very heavy. In order to produce something that's very heavy, 
you need, of course, um, uh, large energy. Um, so in particular, we knew before we turned on the LHC that the Higgs boson had to be billions of electron volts um, in energy, so you need a machine capable of producing billions of electron volts, and that's this Large Hadron Collider. Um, so uh, to give you a sense of scale, it's this 27-kilometer ring, um, so superimposing it on Toronto, you see that it takes up much of the downtown area. Um, and of course, it, the real LHC is located on the border between France and uh, uh, Switzerland near Geneva, um, but this maybe give you a better sense of, of, of scale. Um, okay, so we have to be able to produce it. So we built this big machine to produce it, but we also need large intensity. So what does that mean? Well, the reason we need large intensity is because particles are produced using quantum mechanics. And in quantum mechanics, you never know exactly what you're going to get. You only know the probability that you're going to get something. So for example, if you measure the spin of an electron, you might find you know, 50% of the time it would be spin up and 50% of the time it would be spin down. Uh, for the Higgs boson, it's not quite 50-50. It's more like one in a billion. So if you collide two protons, uh, one, most of the time, uh, you know, a billion minus one times, you'll uh, not get a Higgs boson. And you know, 0.000001% of the time, you'll get a Higgs boson. Um, so that means we need to collide a lot of protons together in order to find the Higgs boson. Um, so if we want uh, you know, a one in a billion chance, we want roughly a billion collisions per second so that accounting for efficiencies and detector response and so on, we have some sense of being able to measure enough Higgs bosons to see them. And I'll get into those numbers a little bit more as we go on. Um, so what does the LHC look like? It's a, it's a big ring, and I kind of drew a picture of the ring. It collides, protons go around this way and go around this way. And in order to get a billion collisions per second, you, get, you have to put a lot of protons together in a bunch. So these are bunches of protons with around um, 10 to the 11, so that's 100 billion protons in each bunch. Um, they're spaced 25 Peter on apart in a 27-kilometer ring, and they collide at four points, but really two main uh, points where they collide them down to the size of a human hair. Right, so down to micron scale, they focus this beam of 10 to the 11 particles. So this is really sort of an engineering miracle. This is one of the greatest um, scientific uh, machines ever built, or machines at all ever built, and it's remarkable that it works so well. Um, so when you do all these collisions, you get a billion collisions per second. Now, the collisions themselves, if you tried to um, record the data from a collision, you would get about a megabyte um, per collision. Right? Um, so if you're getting, uh, you need to record a megabyte, a uh, billion megabytes, per second to your, to your disk drives, that's obviously impossible, um, just because of the, the throughput of the, of the writing. Uh, so the best you could do is roughly around 200, so roughly writing 200 megabytes a second to disk, which is still pretty fast, but that's about what the technology is capable of, or at least it was when they, when they built the LHC. Um, and anyway, that, that results in 10 petabytes per year of data. So this is an enormous amount of data, and somewhere in that, that 10 petabytes are these Higgs bosons. So we have to sift through this 10, 10 petabytes and find you know, a couple of megabytes of that 10 petabytes that represents the thing that we're actually looking for. Um, so how do you see a Higgs boson? So now you need to put in some theory. You need to understand what it looks like. Um, so the Higgs, we don't actually see the Higgs itself. We see its decay products. The Higgs is unstable and decays essentially instantaneously with a lifetime of 10 to the minus 22 seconds into lots of stuff. Um, and we're actually fairly lucky that the Higgs mass is what it is because we get a reasonable fractions of it decaying to um, different kinds of things. And this is good because by measuring different properties, we can, different decay modes, we can measure its properties um, exactly. Um, so a lot of these things have been measured. Um, uh, and in order to measure them, you see that the, to measure lots of different kinds of things, you need what's called a general purpose detector 